of the Christian religion. Notice that their claim was not that Jesus avoided death or that Jesus lived on in some vestigial fashion in the memory of his followers. We carry on his memory through his teachings or through his moral example or through uh, um, a, a fond affection. Jesus was remembered in those ways, but that's not the resurrection claim. Nor is the resurrection experience, and this uh, confounds many Christians' understanding, it wasn't that Jesus was resuscitated for a time. Resuscitation means that somebody dies a clinical death and then comes back to life. It's happened before. It happens now. But such resuscitation simply means that one resumes one's mortal existence. One is still going to die. So resuscitation only defers mortality. It does not transcend it. So the memory of Jesus in fond affection or the imitation of his political program or the memorization of his teaching or the thought that he was resuscitated for 40 days and appeared to people, none of these rises to the level of good news. The gospel message proclaimed by the first believers, the good news, is that Jesus, after his death, entered fully into the power and presence of God, that he was exalted. And the metaphor here is one of enthronement. The Lord said to my Lord, Psalm 110, 1 said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus, therefore, is Lord. He shares the very designation of Israel's God. In the Septuagint, The the proper name of Israel's God, Yahweh, is translated as Kyrios, Lord. And this is the title ascribed to Jesus by the first Christ believers. The resurrection of Jesus, then, is not for these first believers an event of the past, but a condition of the present It is not something that happened only to Jesus, but also to his followers. They have the Holy Spirit. They are being touched by the life of this exalted one. They did not consider it a weakened form of presence, but a more powerful form of presence of Jesus among his followers through the power of the Holy Spirit. It was because of this experience that believers saw themselves in Christ and Christ in them. Obviously, language is being stretched here. And that is why the term spirit is necessary for trying to get at the medium of this deeply paradoxical language. How can one be in Christ when Jesus died 20 years earlier? But this is the claim. They saw themselves not only as a new covenant within Judaism, but as a new creation and a new humanity. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, if anybody is in Christ, there is a new creation, kinectesis. In short, the only proper analogy to what is happening to this group of people with this infusion of divine power is the very creation of the world itself. They are a new humanity. What is important here then is that from the very beginning, Jesus is not simply a Messiah for Jews. He is the image of God for all humans. This claim to the experience of divine power in an immediate and transforming fashion marked the first Christians aside from others in the first century and accounted much more than their moral teaching or manner of life for their appeal to others. 
that a human being had joined the divine realm as a lord and benefactor to humans, as a son of God, would not have seemed strange to Gentiles. But the term Messiah would have been utterly unintelligible to them. In contrast to Jews, the claim that Jesus was a Messiah was not theoretically a problem. But the claim that he was Lord made his followers appear as polytheists and therefore as heretics. If the resurrection of Jesus was the good news, the death of Jesus appeared both to Gentiles and Jews as problematic. The death of Jesus appeared to disqualify him as a source of divine life for others. In his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, Paul acknowledges to his readers that the message of the cross, as he terms it, which was for Christians the power of salvation, appeared to Greeks as foolishness and to Jews as a stumbling block. We need to examine this statement. Remember that in antiquity, the manner of a person's death was the proof of the quality of that person's life. The way you died proved something about the way you lived. Jesus' violent death by legal execution disqualified him as a source of divine life for both sides of the cultural world. Paul says that the Greeks seek wisdom. He means that Gentiles would recognize that a great soldier or a great sage or a great leader of some sort could join the gods, as the hero Heracles had joined. Polytheism is a marvelously inclusive kind of religious system, and the membrane between the gods and humans is a permeable one. So the gods could come among humans, and humans might, with great virtue, great wisdom, great power, join the gods. As I said, the proclamation that Jesus is Son of God would not have bothered the Gentiles terribly, although it would not have set him apart as exclusively God's Son. But the sticking point is crucifixion, the most shameful of all deaths in which somebody is exposed naked to the gaze of others in a combination of torture and asphyxiation, a mode of death that the Romans used mainly for slaves and for rebels against the Roman order, making them appear as slaves. This, to the eyes of Greeks, could only appear as foolish. Paul says in turn, the Jews seek signs, meaning that if Jews are seeking a Messiah, they want to find some evidence that Jesus was a genuine Messiah for the Jews. But Jesus did nothing to make things better for the Jewish people. He did not restore the kingdom or the temple or the law. In Jewish terms, Jesus was, at best, a failed Messiah. But worse, he may well have been a false Messiah. The manner of Jesus' life was that of a sinner. He did not observe Torah. He did not keep the Sabbath. He did not observe purity regulations. He was not a righteous person. And the proof of that for his fellow Jews was the manner of his death. The manner of Jesus' death was one cursed by God. For Torah itself in Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, Cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. Jesus, therefore, could not be the source of life 
for others. He was himself cursed. This problem that Paul identifies is not a problem only for outsiders. Those who came to believe in Jesus and accepted the message of the cross as the power of God's salvation were also Greeks and Jews, bringing their cultural perceptions into the community with them. The earliest Christians, therefore, experienced what sociologists call cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance appears to be the apparent contradiction between one's symbolic world and one's experience. Examples of cognitive dissonance can range from the obvious, the lights don't go on when I flip the switch, to the profound and the tragic. Parents should love their children, but I am being abused. Such dissonance must be resolved. Humans cannot live in a state of cognitive dissonance. So humans must either deny their convictions or deny their experience or reinterpret their convictions in light of their experience. Within their symbolic world, that is, the symbolic world of the first Christians, Jesus ought not to have been the source of life because of the manner of his death. That's the conviction. But their experience of God's power in the Holy Spirit in their lives, a power that manifested itself in new capacities and which they saw as deriving from Jesus, made them call him both Lord and Christ. In order to maintain both their experience and their symbolic world, they had to reinterpret their symbols in light of their experience. In order to get on with their own story then, they had to come to grips with Jesus' story, especially his death. Thus the process of reinterpretation that began at once led to the construction of the Passion Accounts the story of Jesus' suffering as the first part of the Jesus story to reach set form. From the time of its birth and earliest growth, Christianity was a complex and tension-filled religion. Sociologically, it was underdetermined and parasitic. Beginning as a sect of Judaism, it was expelled from the synagogue and became a Gentile association or intentional community, without obvious boundaries. Culturally, Christianity was mixed from the beginning, with a symbolic world shaped first by a Judaism that was already Hellenized, and with much greater success among Gentiles than among Jews. Religiously, It made claims to an experience of ultimate power through the Holy Spirit that were cosmic in scope, but alarmingly disproportionate to their actual situation in the world. Conceptually, the founding figure of Jesus presented a set of major challenges to human understanding. Was he cursed? or the source of blessing. If he was Lord, then what does that mean for monotheism? Many of the subsequent issues faced by Christians would involve the same tensions that marked its entry into the world and its first expansion. In the next presentation, we will examine Christianity's first rapid expansion across the Roman Empire and engage the first and most important of the interpreters of Jesus, the persecutor-turned-apostle Paul.